Hi all, thanks for uh, tuning in as it were. I think that uh, this particular podcast is the most important so far and is a conversation that we absolutely must have. So I'm Dilip Sarkar, I am a Battle of Britain historian, I'm currently writing the eight volume official history of the Battle of Britain for the Battle of Britain Memorial Trust and National Memorial to the Few. It's a million word project looking at every single combat, every single day of battle, minute by minute, 360, also including Bomber Command, Coastal Command, the Home Front, the politics, uh, everything. So this has been a massive study. It's based on over 40 years of research and it's so far taken two years to write. I am currently up to October the 7th, 1940, which is the day uh, when it was really the last big raid, uh, which were JU-88s that went for Westland Aircraft Factory in Yeovil. But this podcast is about combat claims. Now, you've got to understand that there is a gulf of difference between a combat claim and an actual kill. A gulf of difference. A chasm, in fact. You cannot base analysis on claims. Okay? It's just absolutely not. And there is so much rubbish that's been written and so much rubbish that's on the internet and YouTube and social media People just simply fail to grasp the basic behind this. So it's an uncomfortable conversation in some ways, but it is one we have to have because the evidence is what it is. So let's let's really have a look at this. So what is a combat claim for a start? Well, a combat claim is what a pilot thinks he has done or claims he has done after a combat so with the royal air force fighter command upon landing the pilot would complete if he'd seen action fighter command form f so this is a a, a personal report pilot's personal combat report a description of what what's happened height time location type of enemy aircraft engaged numbers of enemy aircraft engaged uh, and a little essay if you like about exactly what's happened, resulting in what what you claim to have shot down. Now, the Air Ministry had three classifications. Destroyed, probably destroyed, or damaged. So to have a destroyed, ideally, there needs to be a wreck on the ground to be inspected, or the combat needs to be witnessed. Now... That sounds fairly straightforward. The problem, having now looked at this in such detail, although the Air Ministry have put out those instructions, the fact of the matter is there's no consistency between squadrons when it comes to awarding combat uh, victories. So uh, some squadrons virtually award victories Absolutely, every time a pilot presses the gun button uh, for destroyed, other other squadrons not so. And it's just inconsistent. Now, the, the problem with this is, is that unless you actually know what damage you're inflicting upon the enemy, your intelligence picture is faulty. And that intelligence picture is therefore going to misinform strategy and tactics going forward. So it is important. Why did overclaiming happen? This is the problem. Overclaiming uh, is the prevalent and most common problem with air fighting. Everything is moving so fast up there. The more aircraft you have engaged, the greater is the overclaiming factor. Uh, and I find that absolutely fascinating. I've done a huge study on 
the Duxford wing, Douglas Bader's big wing, the first three squadrons strong, then five squadrons strong, 12 group formation that was very controversial, which is a whole subject all of its own. Uh, and whilst the claims of the wing on paper were phenomenal, we now know that on occasions the wing overclaimed by as much as seven to one. So although it's claimed there was stringent analysis of those claims at the time, clearly there was not. And a lot of these combats are taking place at 20, 30,000 feet, particularly between the fighters. And squadron leader Peter Brown, who flew Spitfires with 41 squadron and 611 squadron in the Battle of Britain, he, he once explained it to me, and he was absolutely right, that the Messerschmitt 109 being fuel injected, its standard evasive tactic, was to go into a vertical dive at high speed so that it would hopefully lose its pursuers. Now, when a pilot bunts forward like that and pushes the throttle wide open, it produces a stream of black smoke out of the exhaust. So it's understandable then that a pilot attacking an aircraft that behaves in that manner and seeing the black smoke would assume that it's out of control and he shot it down. Unless you see it crash, you cannot be sure because a lot of these combats took place above cloud. So the target aircraft is going to dive into the cloud where it's going to level out. Unseen by the attacker who, who's none the wiser. Uh, and as Peter rightly said, if you see white smoke, that's a different matter. Because white smoke is glycol, that's coolant. And without coolant, the engine is going to overheat and seize, and the aeroplane is only going one place, and that's down. And I and that that is it just sounds so simple. Amazing. So simple. But yesterday, or the day before, I was writing up the 5th of October 1940. And this was a very interesting day. Well, very, actually. Uh, and during the, during the morning and up to lunchtime, there is an absolute succession of German ME109 fighter sweeps and fighter bomber raids uh, on Kent and directed at London, which are obviously intercepted by 11 group squadrons. And there's a, a, a lot of fighting between South London going down to the coast uh, and over the channel. So we actually look at this. By the end of that period of fighting that day, fighter command squadrons in total claim 15 ME109s destroyed, three probables, 13 damaged, six ME110s destroyed, two damaged, and a rather unfortunate Heinck, uh, Henschel 126 communications aircraft that blundered into a Spitfire over the channel. The reality is that there weren't 15 ME109s destroyed. There were six and two ME110s. Now, it is a fact that amongst Luftwaffe historians, there's this almost irrebuttable presumption that Luftwaffe casualty records are 100% cast iron accurate. They are not. Time and time again, I am looking uh, in this investigation, which is what it is, and I was a detective, so I, I know about investigations and evidence and so on and analysis. There are combats where particularly against lone German bombers, these sort of reconnaissance snoopers and hit-and-run raiders, where RAF pilots have clearly seen the bomber crash into the sea. And it's been witnessed by maybe one or two other pilots, these, you know, flying in pairs or sections. And yet there's no corresponding casualty in Luftwaffe records. So I don't care what anybody says, I do not believe that those records are as accurate as we've perhaps uh, assumed them to be. 
However, on this particular day, I don't think there's any reason to doubt the accuracy of the Luftwaffe Quartermaster General's loss returns. I, I think that uh, in this type of combat, it seems that uh, they, they are accurate. So, whereas 15 ME 109s have been destroyed, in actual fact, there's less than half of that. There's six. So, that's interesting, isn't it? And then you look at the squadrons, the individual squadrons, 303 Polish squadron, consistently overclaims, substantially. And the problem with that is that by the when all of these things were totted up, in terms of claims, 303 squadron would come out after the battle as the top scoring squadron. Now, the reality of that is the number of those claims that actually corresponds to uh, a German aircraft really shot down is very different. It's a very different picture. So, for example, in this particular combat, uh, 303 Squadron claimed five ME-110s destroyed and two damaged, four ME-109s destroyed and two damaged. The reality is that only two ME-110s are destroyed and two are damaged. And we've already said that in total, through all of those combat claims, all of those combats, there's only six ME-109s destroyed. And there certainly weren't four just by 303 Squadron or the ME-110s. There are other squadrons, other pilots involved with this. Why is this? This is because the speed of everything happening up there, uh, the speed of it deceives the human eye. And you can have several pilots attacking the same aircraft, completely oblivious to each other. And that then means that a single ME-109, for example, could be multiplied on the balance sheet half a dozen times. So one ME-109 becomes six ME-109 shot down. Okay, so this is, this is evidence now. This is demonstrable fact. Nothing more, nothing less. Demonstrable fact fact so it's a problem isn't it and if we then look at the combat reports and the 5th of october is a very interesting day actually it, it dawned on me when i was working on it that quoting from the pilot's combat report so it's the pilots speaking to you themselves not an author uh, uh rewriting it all you know in third person i mean it, it is the pilots i quote everything because i like you know it's first hand that's what i want uh, and I believe that's what the readers want. So they are telling us what's happened. That little essay that we spoke about earlier, the description of events. And it's clear that as you go through these, certain pilots, that they are operating independently, but they're clearly describing the same combat, the same incident but they're unaware of each other. So it's an absolutely fascinating thing. Now, an American, John Alcorn, and it must be going back to about 2000, I would think, uh, did some uh, incredibly groundbreaking research for the time and uh, stood all of this on its head because he looked at all of the claims offset against the actual losses and... Uh, completely redrew the table of top scoring fighter squadrons and quite honestly you could also do that with top scoring fighter pilots if you were able to ascertain whether a claim actually does correspond to a wreck on the ground or a wreck in the sea the trouble is it's so difficult especially when you've got lots of aircraft involved to work out who shot down who anyway um, but that's that. So it's really, really fascinating stuff. Now, let's talk about the Germans, because this, this is where the shock and awe comes in. Really does. So the German system, the Reich uh, Luftministerium, the um, German Air Ministry, they only have one category of victory, and that is destroyed. And 
German uh, pilots, unlike our own, didn't serve tours. They they weren't rested. So if you were a fighter pilot, you were you were on the squadron uh, in the front line until such time as you were either killed or incapacitated by wounds, uh, or indeed Germany surrendered or won the war, whichever whichever was going to happen. So. That's one reason why the German pilots have such huge scores, several hundred, some of them. The other reason for that, and this is slightly off topic, but the other reason for that is that um, they have a lot more targets to shoot at, uh, and especially obsolete aircraft in Poland and, uh, and, and Russia uh, and so on. Uh, and in the West, when the Blitzkrieg started in May 1940, you know. So that's one reason why they've got so many... Uh, many, many more than ours. I mean, Johnny Johnson, my great friend, was our uh, officially top-scoring fighter pilot of the war with 38 and a half victories, the half being a shared uh, 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 victory with another pilot. But when you've got the Germans with several hundred claims, you know, a lot of people ask why, but that is the reason why. Now, I'm pretty sure, you know, that, that I've looked at all of this and, and the Germans also overclaimed on occasions, substantially, substantially overclaimed. Other times, probably I would say most of the time, their claims are much more accurate than fighter commands, much more accurate. But there are occasions when they've substantially overclaimed. And another thing, actually, is aircraft mis misidentification is common. If a pilot writes in his combat report, he's attacked a Dornier 215 or a Heinkel 111, you can't take it as gospel. You have to go back and have a look at that, at the operations that were happening on that day, because time and time again, I've looked at things where uh, Heinkels have been reported attacked, and they're not Heinkels, they're JU-88s or they're ME-110s even. Uh, and of course, there's, there's the famous case of... Uh, Heinkel 113s, HE 113s being reported frequently in the Battle of Britain. Uh, and they're not Heinkel 113s, they're Messerschmitt 109s. The Heinkel 113 was a prototype single-engine fighter that the Germans made a big propaganda ruse about, lots of photographs of it, apparently in service. But in reality, it never entered service. But the number of combat reports that the Heinkel 113 appears in uh, is incredible. But going back to the 5th of October 1940, this is really, really shocking, actually. So, while all of this is going on over Kent and towards London, all of this, these relentless fighter sweeps, Yafu 3 sends another fighter sweep across the Central Channel area. So, this is Luftwaffe 3 now, based around Cherbourg. And this comprises of 40 Jagerschwader 2 ME109s, I think 8 from JG53, and 38 ME110s from Zestur Geschwader 26. Now, you'll read in a lot of places, oh, there was a heavy raid on Southampton. No, there wasn't. It wasn't a raid on Southampton. It was a fighter sweep. I've got the German intelligence documents. Uh, it was a pure fighter sweep. Uh, and these fighters, German fighters, they sweep over the Isle of Wight and between the Needles and Bournemouth, they find the hapless 10 Hurricanes of 607 Squadron who are up from Tangmere on patrol and stab uh, one grupper JG2 and one and three staffel JG2 uh, bounce these hurricanes. One pilot is shot down and bails out. Three other hurricanes are damaged, shot up, damaged, and the pilots crash land. And an unspecified number of the remaining six return to base damaged. So, whichever way you look at it, it is a highly successful ambush. And the Germans suffered no loss because 607 Squadron's pilots were unable to retaliate. Now, this is where it now gets really interesting. 
three hurricanes, well, in total, the Germans claimed ten hurricanes destroyed. So there's an overclaiming factor there. Three of those were claimed by none other than Hauptmann Helmut Vick, who was the Gruppenkommandier of one Gruppe uh, JG2. A rising star indeed. Now, this brought his kills to 39. So at 20 victories, a German fighter pilot would receive the Ritter Kreuz, the Knight's Cross, the throat decoration. For 40 victories, he would receive the Eichenlaub, the Oak Leaves. So, Vic had got his Knight's Cross after his 20th victory on the 25th of August. And then he's in, he's in the land of the gods then, really. Now, Werner Melders, the father of modern air fighting, he got his 20th victory on the 27th of May 1940 during the fall of France. So he got his Knight's Cross then. 1st of August 1940, Adolf Galland got his Knight's Cross. 20th of September 1940, sees Melders uh, notch up his 40th, for which he became only the second German serviceman to receive the coveted oak leaves, the Eichenlaub. So that indicates a double award of the Ritterkreuz. So it's, it's a bar, really, to the Knight's Cross. And on the 25th of September... 1940, Gallen got his oak leaves for his 40th kill. So, Vic is obviously very keen to be the third airman to receive the oak leaves. So, what we know is that afternoon, Vic claimed three hurricanes. And we also know that at the same time, while all of that's going on, at uh, uh, well, a little bit, a little bit later, actually, there's another sweep, and uh, at 1651 hours, uh, 11 hurricanes of 238 squadron left Chill Bolton to patrol Middle Waller, and they see 50 enemy aircraft five miles out to sea between Southampton and Portland Bill. I'm reading directly from the squadron records. No attack was made by our aircraft, although other friendly squadrons were in the vicinity, as a trap was suspected. And this bit is in italics, my italics. The enemy aircraft made no attempt to offer battle. OK, now, there's no other 10 group Hurricane or Spitfire squadrons patrolling in the Solent Portland area at that time. So that's 79 squadron at Pembury, uh, 87 squadron at Exeter, 152 at Warmwell, 234 at St. Evel, 504 at Filton, uh, 601 at Exeter and 609 at Middle Wallet. None of those aircraft are in the Solon to Portland area at that time. And the only sorties from the adjacent 11 Group Tangmere sector were 607 Squadron made its fifth sortie of the day, between 1520 and 1540 hours of patrol uh, and a patrol of base Tangmere between 1705 and 1825 hours and on both occasions the result was nothing seen between 1600 and 1750 Tangmere's 213 squadron also patrolled base uneventfully and similarly between 1655 and 1750 uh, patrol base in Portsmouth the Spitfires of West Hampton, its 602 Squadron, also patrolled without event between 1400 and 1510, 1600 to 1620, and 1655 to 1750 hours. And none of these squadrons saw or contacted the enemy. None of those 11 group squadrons from Tangmere. So, why then? Does our friend Hauptmann Helmut Vick claim a Spitfire destroyed 
over the Isle of Wight at 1835 hours, continental time, so that's 1735 British summer time, and another at 1840 hours in the Isle of Wight area, another Spitfire. So that then brings his score uh, to 40 and 41, thereby qualifying him for the Oak Leaves. Now, this is for, this is incredible, absolutely incredible. And we're told, aren't we, that, you know, Luftwaffe claims they went through this stringent uh, award process at the, the German Air Ministry, and they had to be witnessed, and so on and so forth, you know. No, no, look, we can't dress this up any other way. This is lies. Pure and simple lies. How did this happen? They've obviously gone up again. There's another sweep, because 238 Squadron have seen the Germans in the distance, five miles out from Southampton, over the sea. But there's no Spitfires lost. There's not even any hurricanes lost. There's not even any combat where Vic could have hit a Spitfire and thought he destroyed it, but it's actually damaged. There is nothing happened. We're quite clear about that with the fighter command records. There is no combat. The only Spitfire lost that evening was Tadeusz Niewieski, Polish pilot of 609 Squadron, who jumped out of a Spitfire over uh, Salisbury Plain because of a technical issue. Nothing to do with combat, nothing to do with ME-109s, certainly nothing to do with their friend Hopman Helmut Vick. But of course, Vick now, uh, our friend um, Hopman Gainst, who is the uh, intelligence officer who's writing these documents that, uh, that, that I have uh, here, uh, very excited because Vic has now exceeded 40 kills and he's the, you know, far and away the highest scoring pilot in Air Fleet 3, Luftflotte 3, uh, and he's third in line in, in the whole of the Luftwaffe. They're very excited about this. And, and what, what happens then is the following day, uh, Vic is summoned to Berlin to, to meet with Goering and he then travels with Goering in Goering's personal train, Asia. Uh, which I think was a bit like the Orient Express, from what I can gather, with very opulent mode of transport. And they travel to Berchtesgaden, where Hitler invests Vic with the Oak Leaves. And after that, Vic is rolled out to an international press conference where he goes down like a lead balloon. Or well, I suppose I should say lead parachute, really. Where he tells uh, the assembled press men, who include American journalists, America obviously still being neutral at the time, that the best RAF pilots have been killed and those remaining are either scared or cowards and anti-aircraft defences are rubbish uh, as are barrage balloons, ridiculed the whole thing and uh, just came across as a particularly obnoxious individual and it didn't go well. Uh, and in fact, when it was published in Life magazine in December, uh, you know, Vic was sort of definitely portrayed uh, as an arrogant uh, Nazi airman. Uh, and there we are. But by then, of course, Vic was dead because he uh, was shot down by 609 Squadron's John Dundas on the 28th of November 1940 off the Isle of Wight. And then Dundas was shot down, I think, by Rudy Flans, who was uh, Vic's great friend and wingman. Uh, Dundas uh, and Vic end up in the channel, in the Solent, never to be seen again. But what a thing, that we're brought up, aren't we, that uh, these people are honourable, chivalrous, and, uh, you know, great heroes. And uh, I probably first heard about Helmut Vick when I was 10 years old, when um, the Airfix 124th spit scale Spitfire, uh, sorry, Air Messerschmitt 109, was released. Uh, and it was Vick's aircraft with this, you know, big yellow nose and the mottled uh, camouflage down the fuselage. And it was a great artwork, I remember. Um, so when you when you look into it to this extent and you discover these things, it really does stand everything on its head. But I do wish that people would 
understand the difference between a claim and a confirmed kill. And I find this business with Helmut Vick just absolutely shocking. Could you ever imagine somebody like like Brian Lane, Sandy Johnston, uh, all of these people, George Unwin, uh, people like that, honourable people, uh, just coming up with a lie? And how did he get away with it? That's what I don't understand. How did he get away with it? Were there other people uh, who were party to this in, in JG2? In this star flight, maybe? We'll never know. But, but one thing I do know, and I can say emphatically, there was no combat that evening, late that afternoon, and uh, Helmut Vick certainly did not shoot down two Spitfires. So there we have it. I think it's an important conversation that we need to have uh, about the losses and claims and about this kind of thing going on, uh, which is just not on, is it? So there we are. I hope you found it interesting. I'm sure it will provoke some discussion. Uh, you know, please put your views down on the comments. And if you've enjoyed our podcasts and our videos, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, I'll be back soon with some more revelations. So uh, thanks for listening and um, speak to you soon.